to read verses 3 through 14. This is Paul's letter to the uh, Paul, an early Christian leader called an apostle, to the church in the city of Ephesus in what is today western Turkey. It's ruins now, but at the time it was the, I believe, third largest city by population in the Roman Empire. And Paul is writing, and I'm going to begin reading now, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 3. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Well, I'm going to begin my message today with the thing that I say just about every week lately, and that is that we're in the middle of a series that I've been preaching on these important topics for human life, sex and marriage. And as I've said up to this point, we don't talk about these things all the time. We don't even talk about these things in this church very often. But we do need to talk about them sometime because they're of such great importance for us as human beings. They are the source of our life as human beings. And they're also the cause of great destruction and great difficulty for many people. And they attract such enormous attention in our world. And God talks about them in the Bible. And as I've said before, as I go along in this series, I've been preaching these in such a way that the things that I'm saying now are resting on things that I've already said from the Word of God. And so if there's some of these that you've missed, I encourage you to go onto our website as it's listed here and to catch some of the ones that you've missed. If you hear some things that I say today that you have some objections and think, I don't believe that or that doesn't make any sense, chances are I've already covered that in a previous message. And so I encourage you to look at that. So far, I've talked about why we can rely on the Bible for knowledge about these things. I've talked about what marriage is, the definition of marriage as God invented it. I've talked about the goodness of sex, which God designed. And I've talked about singleness and the value of living single on purpose and how to do that. I've also laid out five whys, as I've put it, that are the foundations for what Christians believe about these things. These are the bases for all of the what's of what is good and evil, what is right and wrong about sex and marriage. And I'd like to point out particularly the first two. First, that God loves you enough to speak through the Bible and we can understand it. That is essential for anything that we're going to be talking about here. And secondly, that God invented sex and marriage for our good and for His. Which means that all of the things He tells us about how to live sexually and maritally, all of these things, all the rules that He gives us are for our benefit. They are for our health and for our blessing as well as for His good for what He's doing in the world. Now last time, two weeks ago when I was last here, that was the first message in the series that focused on a deviation from God's plan for sex and marriage. All the other ones have been very much about the good stuff. And, and last time was the first that I focused on a deviation from God's plan, specifically on this word that appears in the New Testament, this word in the Greek, pornea which as I described in ancient Greek, the word meant prostitution 
or illicit sex, although the Greeks weren't sure exactly what was and what was not. They had a lot of debate among each other about that. And in our old Bibles that you might have, like the King James Version, it's translated fornication. And in our newer Bibles, like the NIV, it's translated sexual immorality. It's that word that appears in Ephesians 5, which we just read. And I talked about how Jews in Jesus' day defined pornea as any sex that takes place outside of marriage between spouses. That was their definition, and so these Jews, including Jesus and Paul and these others in the New Testament, when they were writing about pornea, that was their operative definition. That's what they were talking about. Well, today... I'm talking about another deviation from God's design, and that is pornography. Now, the word itself, as you can imagine, ties itself to what we talked about last time. The first half of the word pornography comes from pornea. And the second half comes from the Greek word graphe, which means writing. So pornography is using media to involve the reader or viewer in mental pornea. Now, this idea of mental pornea might strike you as odd. But before I address it, I want to define it more and also give some reasons of why it deserves its own message today. First of all, when I talk about pornography, I'm including everything of this nature even if there's not complete nudity. So yes, the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition is pornography. It's just a matter of degree. Second, the immediate thing that we think about when we think about pornography is something visual like a magazine or a movie. And these tend to be consumed by males, by men. But we must also include romance novels with erotic scenes, which heavily draw females, or for that matter, romantic movies that are exceptionally steamy. Now these often get a pass. They don't often get counted as porn because they're not shrink-wrapped and they're allowed to be sold to customers under 18. But they're simply different delivery methods for different audiences. See, a major reason for the different media is that women tend to crave story and relationship for their arousal, and men don't really require hardly anything at all for their arousal. Now, why is it so important that we talk about this? I'm glad that somebody laughed at that. This is kind of a heavy topic, and so there needs to be a few light moments every once in a while. Thank you, Jesse. You always come through for me with the jokes. Um, It's important that we talk about this, as uncomfortable as it might be, because it is saturating our culture like never before. There are many statistics I could share about this, but in the interest of time, I'm only going to share one. And it's this graph right here. This is the graph of the percentage of Americans who view porn at least once a month. The three upper bars are men, the three lower bars are women, and those bars represent different age cohorts, ages 18 through 30, 31 to 49, and 50 through 68. So as you can see that among men ages 18 through 30, about four out of five Americans view pornography at least once a month. You can also see that the number of women 18 through 30 who do so is almost as high. This is not a man issue. Not anymore. This is a human issue. I could also mention that of that 79% there in the 18 through 30 range for men, that most of those, four out of five of them, are viewing it at least several times per week. Now, as as men get older, um, the, the gap between once a month and several times per week gets wider. And then when you get down to women, there are very few who are watching it several times a week. That number for 18 to 30 goes from 76% to something like 20% are are watching it, are viewing it uh, at least several times per week. But you notice for this that there's a difference between generations, isn't there? Now, some of the difference between generations is because they're different ages, And presumably because they have different levels of physical sex drive at their different ages. But it's also because, and especially you can see this with women, the pornification of our society has fundamentally changed thoughts and expectations for the emerging generation. So much that used to be considered sexually explicit material has soaked into mainstream entertainment has soaked into movies, it's soaked into TV commercials, it's soaked into video games. And that has changed how young people view sexuality. For example, last year, as some of you know, 
there was an incident of harassment that took place on our Hollidaysburg High School football team. There was heavy discipline that was, that was administered because of what took place. Now, in our growth group, um, some of us with, has multiple generations in our growth group. We were talking about this, and we observed that two generations ago, if you were on the football team and you were hazed, it meant that you were beat up really bad. And then one generation ago, if you were on the football team and you were hazed, you might have been beat up some, but a lot of it is you were just the upperclassmen slave and you were just carrying their stuff around all the time. But in this generation, the harassment incident that occurred, even though it wasn't strictly hazing because it happened to all grade levels, had a sexual component to it that um, that was dominating and that was humiliating that was foreign to previous generations. I mean, that, that kind of thing just did not happen in locker rooms in previous generations. Why? Because the younger generation has been exposed to sexually violent and sexually explicit material like never before. So what? Is this really a big deal? Well, many people insist that people are free to do what they want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. In fact, freedom is a commonly used word when it comes to porn. That people are free to use it, that most people try to get it for free on free sites while others buy it on the free market. And pornographers have a right to free speech and pornographic models and actors are free to do with their bodies what they please. But this is a complete lie. Pornography is not about freedom. It is about bondage. It is about slavery. It is inherently destructive. And it destroys and enslaves the people who are involved in it and the people around them. Here's the Bible's answer to the position that I'm free to enjoy what I want. Here's what Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians 6. He wrote, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And this is a good principle for all kinds of things, including food, which he talks about later in the book of 1 Corinthians. But, but this, everything is permissible to me. Apparently, this is what people in Corinth were saying. They were saying, we're Christians, and Jesus Christ has set us free, and he's given us the freedom to do whatever we want. Okay? And Paul says, is quoting them back to themselves. Yeah, okay, everything's permissible for me. Yeah, maybe I can do whatever I want, but that doesn't mean that everything I want to do is good. It can be harmful to me. It can be harmful to other people. Yeah, sure, everything's permissible for me. I'm free to do whatever I want, but I'm not going to be mastered by anything. I'm not going to allow my freedom to turn into slavery, whereby myself making a free choice to do what I want, I end up getting enslaved to something that I can't get out of. Paul goes on to apply this then to prostitution, which was a very, very live issue in a city with hundreds or even thousands of working prostitutes. He wrote, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, that's that word pornea again, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, you might think, well, this is applying if my body is involved. But if I just watch something, my body is not involved. Well, I'm going to address that in a bit. But for now, I want you to note an irony in our society. If a drug-addicted woman with no marketable skills, who is basically enslaved to her pimp for money for herself and her kids to survive and for her to get the drugs that she's dependent on, if she goes to a hotel and gets paid to have sex, then that's prostitution. And in most states, she's broken the law and she's sent to jail. But if exactly the same thing happens, except the pimp also has a camera rolling with plans to sell the video, then that's called free speech and it's legal. Is that crazy or what? So yeah, porn is prostitution, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's another irony about this though, and this comes right out of the passage. This is what Paul says. If we use our freedom to engage in pornea of any sort, we will destroy and enslave ourselves. But if we live as slaves of God, who bought us with his son Jesus' blood, 
and now owns us, then we'll experience freedom like we've never known before. If you use your freedom to engage in pornea, you will become a slave. And if you consider yourself a slave redeemed by God for himself, you'll become free, truly free. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'm going to talk about how pornography destroys those who use it and how they can be free. And second, I'm going to talk about how pornography destroys those who make it and how you and I can help them to be free. And third, I'm going to talk about how pornography destroys the spouses of those who use it and how they can be free. So first, pornography in the user. Now, it's, it's really not difficult at all to demonstrate from the Bible that pornography is wrong and destructive. In prior sermons, I've shown how God created sex and marriage to go together. But I also showed how Jesus and the apostles took God's instructions in the Old Testament and moved them into the heart. For example, what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew that we've already seen, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what defile a person, right? So those things come out of the heart, and those are the things that defile. This is from, that's from Matthew chapter 15. Another example is from Matthew chapter 5, which I'm going to read to you. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you see, Jesus takes those instructions about the outsides of ourselves and puts it in the insides of ourselves. We see the same thing in what Paul is talking about in Ephesians. He gives great counsel and great, um, very strong advice on this. He says in Ephesians 5, verse 3, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, of pornea. There shouldn't even be a hint of it or of any kind of impurity. I mean, there, there's, nobody should be flirting with this at all. Notice he says, among you. So, so he's not just saying to you as an individual, but in the church itself, which is something we're going to talk to about in a future week. In the church itself, there shouldn't be anybody who is doing this. And the church must not put up with any of this going on. This is not a good thing. And not only does he say about sexual immorality, but also of greed, which is very important. Now, that's a, that's a sticky one, right? I mean, that's not something we talk about all that much. But it's very important. He says that people are greedy, or greedy for money, greedy to, you know, like fill their own bank account, greedy to, you know, fill their own portfolio, are idolaters. That's a big one. But that's for another message. Can't get too deep into that here today. But he says this. This you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. In other words, don't let anybody out there tell you it's really not that bad. That's going to kill you, he says. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. But he also says, you know, don't even joke about this stuff. He says in verse 4, there should not be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I don't think when he's talking about obscenity, he means, you know, the bad word. I don't really think that's the point. I think his point is the subject matter of our conversation or our entertainment or what we find interesting or what we want to gossip about about other people that we find interesting immorality. We shouldn't find it interesting and we shouldn't find it funny. And the, and the stuff that we consume for entertainment should not be built around that, should not be based on that. Because it's making, it, it's making light of something that's actually deadly. And, and so, so if we shouldn't even be talking about it, if we shouldn't be fantasizing about it, then certainly it's not a good thing to, to film it or to shoot it and then to be watching it and to be getting a charge out of that. So choosing to view or meditate on it is dangerous because God judges us for what we fantasize about doing, not just what we actually do. But it's also dangerous because of what it does to ourselves. And God knows this. He made his rules about this for our health and happiness and protection. I want to give some examples of this from the perspective of the male brain. And in short, there's a, there's a short free ebook on this that I posted on Facebook and Google Plus today. So you can go to my, my pages on those websites and find this and read it for yourself. Neuroscientists have done brain mapping studies related to pornography usage. They find that pornography usage mirrors the effect on the brain of alcohol and drug addiction. For example, poor memory function. 
the more porn is used, the greater the change. Furthermore, in the male brain, pornography usage highly activates the part of the brain that manages the primary drives for survival, the hypothalamus. In other words, males quickly get conditioned to feel as if they need to view it in order to survive. In addition, brain scientists have also found that men who view pornography, whether just a model or sexual activity, put themselves in the scene as if they were participating. But of course, they're not participating, and that creates an enormous problem. You might remember in a previous message, I talked about different chemicals that fire in the brain during sexual activity. And the cocktail of the first wave of chemicals creates exhilaration and desire. And then after the experience climaxes, there's a second wave that, are ki that kick in that are nicknamed the cuddle hormones. And they promote affection and bonding toward the person that you're intimate with. And here's why this matters. When a man uses pornography, he gets flooded with the first wave of chemicals, but when he finishes, the second wave never comes. And so the result is a dreadful anticlimax. It feels like something's missing. And to make matters worse, that first wave of chemicals are the very same chemicals in the brain that are simulated by heroin. So the man who looks at porn literally becomes a drug addict, addicted to his own brain chemicals manufactured in his own body. Furthermore, controlled studies have also shown that the use of pornography decreases overall satisfaction, sexual satisfaction, including satisfaction with one's actual flesh and blood partner. People who use it place a lower value on marriage, on the whole, on the desire for children, and on the rights of women. And they demonstrate less ability to interact with women. There's also a proven correlation, though which causes the others unclear, between pornography and loneliness, depression, and anxiety. In addition, Men who use it are more likely to believe that women enjoy rape and that many rape accusations are made up and they are more likely to physically abuse their partners. Now God knows all of this and that's a major reason why he's so stern about telling us not to engage in it. So I want to talk a little bit about then how to get out of it, how to stop. Because this is something that I know well. Uh, as some of you know, I've talked about this in the church before, though not from the pulpit before. This is something that I've had to deal with in my life. Um, I've had to deal with it a lot. Uh, it, it especially really uh, crested for me um, when I was a young man, soon after leaving college, getting married, going to seminary, facing a lot of difficulties and struggles there for many reasons. And, uh, and at that time, the internet became a thing. The internet wasn't really a thing before that, and then the internet was a thing, and so access was way out there. And so there were great difficulties that I had, and I, and I um, struggled badly and failed a lot. But then in 2004, um, I hit a turning point and, and began to recover, began to build new habits in my life. And it's continued to be up and down since, but mostly up. And, uh, and I give grace to God for that. And so these things I'm going to talk about are just... Just a very short summary of some things that I've learned that I want to hand off to you. First of all, how to stop. Get good spiritual food every day. Be in the Word of God every day. We talk about the 515 plan, the 15 minutes a day, at least five days a week to read the Bible or to listen to the Bible. It's important to have that as regular input into your mind. That by itself will not break you out. That by itself is, is not the only preventive means, but without it, it's very, very difficult. You need to have good, positive stuff from the Bible, God's truth flowing in your mind. Secondly, deliberate work on the roots. You know, the, the use of porn is on the surface, but there are things deep down that are driving that in you. And so the way to deliberately work on the roots is through counseling, through doing the 12 steps in a 12-step program like Sexaholics Anonymous, there's a, an essay group that meets in um, uh, State College on Tuesday nights. You can go to essay.org and find out when and where it meets. Also, and I have a number of these things listed in the insert in your bulletin, um, Faithful and True, a book and a ministry by a guy named Mark Lazar. Uh, and also just getting counseling. Your issue might not be a sexual issue. It might be depression and anxiety. And you're using pornography to cope. 
And your real issue might be depression and anxiety. And that's the thing that you need help with. So when you do the deliberate work on the roots by getting help in these ways, it fosters self-knowledge so that you know when you're approaching trouble, you know when you're approaching temptation before you get there. Third, godly fellowship. Man, this is so important. It's so important to have somebody that you can talk to about this. Nobody gets out of this on their own. I'm talking nobody. So to have somebody like we talk about in our church, a prayer partner, we want everybody to have a prayer partner that you, that you talk to, that you pray for daily and touch base with weekly. You can come to make those deep relationships by attending growth groups together here in our church. But a prayer partner can also become an accountability partner. Or if you go to a, um, to a, a, a 12-step meeting, that could be a sponsor you know, and the, and the system that they have there. But godly fellowship is so important. The fourth step is covenant eyes. Covenant eyes, I don't know how you can get out of this stuff with the internet without covenant eyes. This stuff is the best money you'll ever spend. Covenant eyes is, a, is an app that you put on your, on your uh, phone, you put it on your iPad, you put it on your computer, that it monitors what you're doing that, and sends that information to an accountability partner that you select so that somebody can keep tabs on you. The great value of Covenant Eyes is it catches all the borderline stuff. It catches the stuff that you flirt with when you're kind of checking some things out before you get to the things that are really nasty so that your friend can see it and write you or call you up and say, are you okay? What's going on? This has been so powerful and impactful for me. I cannot overstate it. And the fifth is elimination of everything that can't be filtered or watched. You have an app on your phone that can't be filtered or watched, delete it and set the parental controls with a passcode that somebody else knows so they now have, so they have to open that up. They have to put in their passcode in order for you to install an app. Likewise, if you've got a TV set that's got an app on it that enables you to, to see something that you shouldn't see, get rid of that app, put the parental controls on that bad boy, and give the, make somebody else set the passcode so that you can't bust into it, right? You, you've got to be serious about this. You can't mess around with any of this stuff. So th that's, that's how, if you're a user, how you can, uh, some steps that you can take to get free. But I also want to talk a little bit, um, and not as much as I would really like to, but just a little bit about the freedom that the producers desperately need because they're in bondage too. Pornographers claim that pornography is free speech, but that's actually not true. Because federal courts have consistently interpreted the First Amendment not to extend to hardcore pornography. Federal law actually prohibits its distribution, but the law goes unenforced. If the federal government would just enforce the laws that are already on the books, most pornography, especially hardcore pornography, would be eliminated from our country. This is the truth. In fact, former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder shut down the Obscenity Prosecution Task Force in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. He shut it down. So there are no prosecutions going on anymore. And this is all the more outrageous as the resource is mounting that pornography is as dangerous as drugs, but we continue to spend billions of dollars on stopping the illegal drug trade and spend nothing on stopping the illegal pornography trade. It's an outrage. And the travesty of this is not only the harm that it does to consumers, but to the people involved in it. A good example, and a famous one, is Pamela Anderson. Now, Pamela Anderson has a foundation that she started several years ago for a cause that's close to her heart, which is the prevention of cruelty to animals. And so, when she launched that foundation, she gave a speech. And in that speech, she revealed her childhood. A childhood of abuse and molestation and rape. I was going to read it today, but I chose not to because if any of you have suffered something like that in your childhood, this would be overly traumatic, and so I've not done so. But I've posted her speech, again, on my Facebook or Google Plus page, and I urge you to read it because you need to know what is in the background of these people who get engaged in this. I mean, think about it. Nobody takes off their clothes or performs sexual acts on camera because they like it. Nobody does that. That's insane. It's a lie. They do it because they're enormously wounded, abused, and desperate people. Another story, which is much more positive, is the story of this woman, Shelley Lubin. Shelley Lubin might be the bravest person I've ever heard of. Like Pamela Anderson, she also experienced terrible trauma as a child. She became a stripper, and then a prostitute, and then a porn star. And on the porn set, her abuse continued in ways that truly can hardly be recounted in public. 
but she wrote a book about it called The Truth Behind the Fantasy of Porn, which I strongly recommend. She ended up contracting herpes and human papillomavirus which, on the set, which led to cervical cancer. Amazingly, by a miracle of God, she came to trust the man who would become her husband. The two of them were saved by Jesus Christ, and her life was completely changed. Despite having her cervix partly removed, she became the mother of three children, and now she's the founder and president of the Pink Cross Foundation, and she goes all over the world exposing the truth behind pornography. And what the foundation does is it provides aftercare for performers who are struggling to get out of the industry but have nowhere to go. In other words, they're continuing to do porn to keep from starving. And she reaches out in love to people in the porn industry with the gospel of Jesus Christ. She goes to adult entertainment conventions and hands out tracts and prays for performers. Unbelievable stuff that this woman does. She's endured death threats from pornographers. I mean, crazy stuff, but she's done amazing things. Now, Shelley recounts evidence of nearly everyone on porn sets being infected with diseases. She also explains that especially for the women, nearly all of them are given drugs and alcohol to anesthetize themselves, to enable themselves to go through with it. And then they get addicted to those drugs, which keeps them bound to continue to perform. Here are just two shocking statistics of the results. According to Shelley Lubin, out of about 1,500 performers working in the porn industry located in the San Fernando Valley, California, 228 porn stars that we know of died from AIDS, suicide, homicide, drugs, and premature deaths between 2003 and 2014. That's an amazing statistic of mortality. And the average life expectancy of a porn performer is only 36.2 years. Now, from everything you've heard, does this sound like freedom to you? Does this sound like, like people who make this are just adults choosing what they want to do and no one gets hurt? Women are lured into this by lies and threats, and it falls under the legal definition of human trafficking. In other words, this is modern-day slavery. And every time you click to see this, even if you're not paying, you're demonstrating that there's a market. And so the $3 billion industry keeps growing and growing, and that's just in this country alone. So what can you and I do about this injustice? We can give to support the people who fight it. You can give to the Pink Cross. You can give to International Ministries missionaries through the World Mission Offering. Many of them, you can go to the International Ministries website and see how many of them are fighting human trafficking around the world. Hope for Justice is another ministry. And another one called the War on Illegal Pornography that is trying to mobilize people to get the government to prosecute. You and I can't go back and fight for the abolition of slavery before the Civil War, but doggone it, we can fight slavery today. And this is one way that you and I can do it, to see that the captives are set free. The final thing that I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about, and that has to do with pornography and the spouse and what it does to that person. Now, the person that I know who is the expert on this is my own wife, Kelly, because Kelly has had to suffer from my sin and has had to know how to overcome that. And so she's going to talk to give some counsel to those who are spouses or loved ones of those who are using pornography. So Kelly, please do that with us. During the six years that Corey and I wrestled with his pornography addiction, the Lord taught me a lot about myself, a lot about him, a lot about prayer, and a lot about forgiveness. Though I had been a Christian since the age of nine, it wasn't until I began walking through this situation that my faith was truly tested and grew into something much stronger than I ever knew was possible. Initially, the first thing I knew to do was to forgive Corey. It was simply not an option. I instinctively knew without having to be told or really search the scriptures that I must forgive him. It was very simplistic at first. Jesus tells us that we are to forgive 70 times 7, depending on the translation, but it's not really about the number. In fact, the point is there's no magic stopping point. You always forgive, period. Simply put, Jesus had forgiven all of my sins, so I really didn't have a choice. As time went on, however, I started to learn subtle nuances of forgiveness. I learned that forgiveness wasn't about a feeling. It was a choice and an act of obedience. 
The scripture tells us that we are to forgive one another. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, we ask God to, quote, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Do you realize what that's actually saying? Essentially, we are asking God to forgive us in the same way we have forgiven others, which means if we have not forgiven others, then he's not going to forgive us, and that's kind of a big deal. While saying the words, I forgive you, is necessary, I also learned that my actions were just as important. I couldn't forgive Corey just in word. I had to behave in such a way that backed up what I was saying. I had to let the lines of communication remain open. I had to continue to be affectionate with him and allow him to be affectionate with me. I also learned that the feelings do, in fact, follow. The simple act in obedience of saying that I forgave him and acting like I had forgiven him would eventually usher in the feelings of forgiving. But if I had let myself wait until I felt like forgiving him, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment that I was completely justified in feeling, I might add, would have made it exponentially more difficult for me to make the decision to forgive him later. The other thing that happened during this difficult time was the growth in my relationship with Christ and God's word. The issue of pornography is still kind of taboo in most circles, though Corey had told me that I could talk to anyone I wanted to about it and how I was struggling. I didn't want to disparage him by doing that. It was during this time that I became completely enraptured with the word of God and started studying it with so much more fervor. I realized that God was the only person who had not let me down, and he would always have that role. So I started getting to know him better, not only through his word, but through prayer. There was a book series that I highly recommend by Stormy Omardian called The Power of a Praying Blank. She has praying woman, praying man, praying husband, praying wife. And I picked up The Power of a Praying Wife and started going through it. This kind of brought everything together. Because Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And do you have any idea why? It's because it's really hard to stay angry at somebody that you're praying for. Though I have never been a fan of written prayers, I found the prayers that Stormy had in her book as examples to be a great tool in teaching me how to pray more effectively. And not only that, but I was learning more of God's word through those prayers. Since we can be certain that God's word is also God's will, then when you pray scripture, you can know that you are praying his will, and that's what these prayers were. It's a very powerful thing. So the book kind of brought together what God was teaching me about himself through his word and about the power of prayer and forgiveness. And I think that that's how I would summarize forgiveness. It needs to be used in coordination with prayer and God's word. Paul tells the Ephesians that God has given us everything we need for godliness. He's given us his word, He's given us a Savior who has made a relationship with him possible, and he's given us his Holy Spirit whose power makes it possible to do hard things like obeying him and forgiving others. In Luke's account of Jesus' life, known as the Gospel of Luke in the Bible, the first thing that he shows Jesus doing in his ministry is coming to his hometown of Nazareth on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, when Jews like him would gather to worship. And he took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he opened it up to these words. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And then Jesus said, today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. See, you can be free if Jesus sets you free. It says in the Gospel of John that whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. You just have to trust Him and cooperate with Him. He can free you. He can free you from porn. He can free you from bitterness and grudges. And He can free you from anything else that you're trapped in today. If you want to be free, if you want to be set free, if you want to be set free from sin, from death, from the devil, from hopelessness, from despair, and from yourself, if you want to be set free from depression and anxiety, if you want to be set free from your bondage and your trauma, I invite you to pray along with me right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 
You were sent by your Father to become a human being to set us humans free. To set me free. And Lord, if I've never come to You before, I'm coming to You now to ask that You'd set me free. I confess my sin to You right now. My sin of lust, my sin of pride, my sin of resentment, and I ask you to forgive me by your sacrificial death on the cross. And I ask you to give me new life, and I ask you to make me yours. And Lord, if I've come to you before and I'm coming back to you again, I pray that You would receive me once again and set me on the path of life. I give up my right to determine what is best for myself. I will take any and every direction You send my way. No matter how difficult. No matter how painful. Trusting You that it's for my good and for your glory. Receive me now as your own. Amen. Amen. During this last song, I ask you to take in your bulletin this little card that we have in there. If you didn't get a card, it's in uh, the the seats in front of you. And there's a little card there that uh, you can tear in half along the perforation. And on the side that says First Baptist Church, on the other side there are some options of what you might want to do with this message or what you've already just done in that prayer. And there's a blank space too that you can fill in something new just for yourself. And I ask you to fill that in and use that as a commitment between you and the Lord and to take that home with you as a reminder. And on the other side, if you would, I'd like you all to do this because it's very helpful for Ann and nobody wants Ann to have a difficult time, do they? Our administrative assistant. (laughs) Please take that card and fill in your name because it helps her a lot and it helps me a lot to shepherd you as your pastor. And any contact information we don't have for you. And on the back, if there's a decision you made today, a big one, or something that's going on in your life you want to communicate me, please fill that in. Take this part, leave that there in the seat or put it in my hand discreetly afterwards and it'll get picked up if you leave it there in the seat and, um, and I would be glad to know what's going on. And then when you're done with that, you can sing along with the song that Kelly's going to play.